Magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. No, I'm not speaking in tongues. That is uh, Tagalog, which is the national language of the Philippines, and it's a uh, good morning uh, to all of you. Linda and I are so thrilled to be with you this morning. Uh, as uh, Paul and Scott shared, we were uh, here four years ago, last time we were home uh, from the Philippines, and uh, had great times of fellowship and, and ministry here with uh, the dear folks of uh, the Master's Church. And uh, Linda and I are both from New Jersey. I grew up in the Trenton Princeton area, and Linda's from Cinnaminson. And we are both graduates of the World Life Bible Institute uh, in Screen Lake, New York. We were uh, missionaries with Word of Life for three terms in the Philippines. And now we are missionaries of Lebanon Valley Bible Church in Lebanon, PA. And uh, we are in an itinerant uh, preaching and teaching ministry. <coughs> Uh, for the past four years, uh, our ministry has been basically the preaching and teaching of the Word of God and the Gospel to the Filipino people. So our ministry is a, a ministry of the Word. And uh, we did this through three different avenues. Uh, number one, um, many of you know of uh, the Master's Academy International, and their training center in the Philippines is called the Expositors Academy. And I was teaching with the Expositors Academy, training pastors uh, in the Word of God and uh, biblical uh, church ministry. And we've been doing that for the last three years, uh, four years. And uh, also itinerant preaching in churches and Christian schools and things of that nature. A third ministry we have, which absolutely um, mushroomed since last time we were here, is I have a personal blog on Facebook called Preach the Word. And now there are more Filipinos on Facebook than any other people in the world. Filipinos are addicted to Facebook. And so the Lord led us to start this just teaching the Word of God for a half hour on a live broadcast and then boosting it throughout the Philippines. And because of COVID and the lockdowns that were so severe, all the Filipinos were home all day. And what were they doing? They were on Facebook. So we went from about 1,000 people following us to now we have over 41,000 uh, Filipinos who are following us uh, each week as we minister the Word of God uh, through, uh, through Facebook. So uh, there is some silver lining in there uh, with, uh, with the pandemic. And so, um, but now as we go back, we will be going back to the Philippines in January. And I will no longer be uh, teaching for the Masters or for the Expositors Academy, but I will be doing an uh, a itinerant preaching and teaching ministry. Uh, unlike in the U.S. and the Philippines, there's a tremendous demand for guest speakers, whether it's churches, whether it's schools, whether it's seminaries, are often looking for uh, guest speakers to come and to minister the Word of God. And so we are now back in Manila, living in Manila, and uh, we will be doing this ministry. In fact, the church that we are connected with in Manila, the Union with Christ uh, Christian Church, one of the elders has just been um, appointed as the president of the Biblical Seminary of the Philippines, one of the really good seminaries in the Philippines. And Neil said to me, Pastor Keith, when you come back, I need you to come and, and preach and teach to the seminary students. So we're going to be looking forward to also doing that and ministering to seminary students in the Philippines. And, uh, but other than that, I'm doing itinerant preaching and teaching. I will be a guest lecturer at the Word of Life Bible Institute again uh, in the Philippines, as well as preaching in their camps and things like that. So it's, a, it's an open door still in the Philippines for the gospel. The people are very receptive to the Word of God. And we're just very grateful that the Lord called us uh, to go and, and to minister there. But for today, what I'd like to do is to share some thoughts with you about running to win. Running to win. And, you know, the Bible often uses uh, athletics in the New Testament to illustrate spiritual truth. And the Bible also teaches us, as many of you know, that one day uh, we're going to stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ to be rewarded for uh, our life and service 
to the Lord after we came to know him as Lord and Savior. And the Apostle Paul in the book of Corinthians, in the passage we're going to look at and in some other passages, what he is going to do is he is going to exhort the Corinthians to run their Christian race in such a way that they will win the prize when we stand before the Lord. And so it really is an exhortation and a challenge to live a godly, holy life, faithfully following and serving the Lord all the days of our life. So that when we stand before him on that day, he will say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll be uh, looking at our passage today. Let's pray. Lord, we're just so thankful for your goodness to us, your love for us. We're thankful for the fellowship we have with one another because of our fellowship with you. And Father, we pray as we spend a few moments now looking into your word that you would, uh, again, help us to understand what the word of God is teaching and then make, help us to live our lives in light of it so that we will live lives that are pleasing and glorifying in your sight. We commit this time into your hands and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Running to win. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said this, that we must all, meaning all believers, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And so here, Paul points out that every believer, every Christian, we're going to stand before the Lord one day, and we're going to stand alone. We won't have our parents, we won't have our spouse. We're going to stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, in the Greek, this is the bema seat. The bema seat was actually a reward seat uh, at the Corinthian games that they had in the city of Corinth. You know how in the Olympics, uh, the three winners, they get a gold, and they get a silver, and they get a bronze medal, and they get up on those platforms, and they, they get their medal given to them? And this is the idea, the fact that every believer, we're going to stand before the Lord, give an account, and then we will receive a reward. And that reward will be based on all that we've done after we're saved whether good or bad. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, Paul exhorted the Corinthians not to judge other believers before the time comes when the Lord judges us. You'll remember that there was a little argument going on in court among the Corinthians about their favorite Bible teacher. You know, some were saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. And they were judging Paul and Apollos based upon the, the Bible teacher that they liked better. And so Paul wrote this in chapter 4, verse 5, or 4 or 5. He says, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time. Don't judge other believers before the time before the Lord comes. All right? And because when the Lord comes, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness. Now, one reason we are not to judge one another is because uh, we don't know everything that uh, other people are doing in the dark. Other people don't know what you or I do in the dark. The Lord does. And when the Lord comes and he judges us, he's going to bring to light all those hidden things in our lives that nobody knows about. And that's a scary thought, isn't it? But he will bring it to light. And he will disclose the purposes or the motives of the heart. Because as we live our lives, the Lord doesn't just judge what we do, he judges why we do it. Are we doing it really for his glory? Uh, so that he will be pleased? So it's possible we can be doing the right things, but doing them with the wrong motive. You might remember in Philippians, Paul pointed out that some of the, 
the uh, believers in Rome were preaching the gospel not out of sincerity. They were trying to add affliction to Paul's bonds. They were doing it in competition with Paul. So they were preaching the true gospel, but they were doing it with the wrong motives. But the Lord, when we stand before him, he will disclose the purpose of the heart. And then each one will receive his commendation. He will receive his reward. And so every believer will be rewarded by the Lord. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus pointed out in the parable of the sower and the seed, the parable of the four soils, you remember that parable? Well, he pointed out that in chapter 13, verse 23, as for what was sown in good soil, the seed in the good soil, this is the one, the person who hears the word of God and understands it. It's talking about the believer, the one who hears the gospel, understands it, and believes it. And because we do, all believers bear fruit. But notice it says this. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, another sixty, and another thirty. And so Jesus himself taught that different believers are going to bear different amounts of fruit. And that is because of the commitment and dedication of different believers to the Lord is not the same. And there are some who are extremely diligent in their Christian lives to follow the Lord, to grow in the Lord, to serve the Lord, and they bear fruit a hundredfold. Others, not so much, but they do bear fruit 60, and others, not so much at all, 30. And so we have to understand that Jesus himself taught that uh, as believers, um, we can bear different amounts of fruit. And the ex exhortation that Paul is making is run to win. Run to bear fruit a hundredfold for the glory of God with the right motives. Bible also teaches that we can lose reward. In the little book of 2 John, John was uh, warning uh, the lady not to entertain false teachers and show them hospitality. Because if you entertain and show hospitality to false teachers who are traveling through, then you're actually participating in their false ministry. And so in verse 8, John wrote, watch yourselves, be careful, so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. And so again, a warning as believers, to be careful. The context being about, again, showing entertaining false teachers, but it's really possible, and Paul's going to point this out, one of his great fears in life was that he would preach the word of God and serve the Lord, and then he would blow it at the end and be disqualified from reward. And so be diligent to make sure you're fully rewarded by the Lord. And so in our passage today, 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27, let's look as Paul exhorts the Corinthians to run to win. 9.24 says this, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Now in this verse, Paul is referring to the Corinthian games. In New Testament times, the Olympics in Athens was the number one international uh, games, just like it is today. But the city of Corinth, every few years, also hosted some games, known as the Corinthian Games. And here, athletes would come from all over the world to participate and, uh, in all the athletic events. And he's referring to the races at these Corinthian Games, and he points out that in that race, there are many runners, but only one of them 
would receive the prize. Now we know like in the Olympics today, uh, there's a gold medal, a silver medal, and a bronze medal. But in the Corinthian games, only one received the prize. And so what Paul is doing is he's going to use this illustration to exhort them to run your race in order to win the prize. In other words, follow the Lord, serve the Lord, grow in the Lord, be faithful to the Lord in every aspect of life, all the way to the end, and so you will receive the prize. Verse 25, he says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. We notice this with athletes today, they're very self-disciplined, right? They always make sure they get enough sleep, that they eat only good foods, and they watch what they drink. They exercise self-control in all things. And he points out that these athletes, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. You ever seen any of those old movies where they have those athletic games? Do you remember what the prize is that they all run for? The wreath? What was it? It was a piece of green laurel, all right, a plant. And they would put it on their heads, over their ears, you know? And so these athletes would train and work and discipline themselves just so they can win this green laurel to put around their head. Now what happened to that green laurel, which is out of water after a few days? What happens to it? It perishes, turns brown, it dies. And Paul points out that those athletes are working so hard to receive a prize that perishes in days. But the prize that we are running our race for is eternal. It's eternal. It will be with us forever with the Lord in the new Jerusalem in the end. And so they do it for a perishable, but we imperishable. Verse 26. So Paul says this, so I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. We'll talk about this verse again in a moment. But he's pointing the fact that he doesn't run his race aimlessly. No, he keeps his eye on the goal. If you have a runner in a race, when that gun goes off, they have to keep their eyes on the goal. If they turn to the left or to turn to the right, it's going to slow them down and they're going to lose. And so when he runs his race, he runs it aimlessly, not like one beating the air. Now, some have thought that this is referring to shadow boxing, but actually it's not. It's referring to, have you ever seen a boxing match where in the later rounds, the boxers get really tired? And when they're really tired, they take their eyes off the goal, which is their opponent's head. <laughs> and they wind up swinging aimlessly and they miss the target because they're tired and they took their eyes off the goal. This is the point Paul was making, is that he doesn't run his race each and every day aimlessly. He's not wildly batting the air. But what does he do? He says, I discipline my body and bring it, keep it under control or subjection, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So Paul was very careful to discipline himself, discipline himself, because he did not want to be disqualified after preaching the gospel and teaching the word of God faithfully for so many years. Linda and I often talk about the fact that here as we come to the latter parts of our life and ministry, we don't want to blow it now. <laughs> After serving the Lord for so many years, you don't want to come to the end of a, and because of a lack of discipline, you sin and be disqualified. And as John wrote, not receive a full reward. Not receive a full reward. 
So Paul, again, is exhorting them to run your race to win. Now, what I'd like to do is look at five quick ways, five things that we as believers need to do if we want to win the prize. Okay? Five things. The first we've already looked at in verse 26 is to keep our eyes on the goal. Keep our eyes on the goal. Not running aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. You know, our lives are so full of many things. Work, home, family. And it's very easy as we're going down uh, our life and as we are running our Christian race to lose sight of the goal. To forget about the fact that one day we're going to stand before the Lord and have to give an account of our life. And in order for us to win the prize, we have to keep focused on the goal. Keep the spiritual at the forefront of our thoughts and our minds. There was a wrestler many years ago, uh, one of the greatest NCAA wrestlers ever, a guy by the name of Dan Gable. Any of you ever hear of Dan Gable? <laughs> Some of the older guys, yeah. <laughs> Dan, Dan Gable, he only lost one match his entire college career. And Dan Gable wanted to win a gold medal in the Olympics. And so what he did was he trained eight hours a day, seven days a week, for five years. I mean, every day he would be lifting weights, he would be running, he would be wrestling with the best wrestlers that he could find. And he worked again all these hours, all these days, all these years. And do you know what motivated him during that time? I don't know about you, but after about three years of that, I might get tired of it. But he kept his eye on the goal. He wanted that gold medal more than anything, so he would not allow anything in life to distract him from that goal. And do you know what happened to Dan Gable in those Olympics? He lost. No, I'm just joking. He won. <laughs> gotcha, didn't I? No, he won the gold medal. He won the gold medal. Because again, he kept his eyes on the goal. And we need to do the same thing spiritually. And don't get distracted with tangents to the left or to the right. A second thing we need to do, as we've already seen in verse 27, is to discipline our bodies. He disciplined his body, kept it under control, lest after preaching to others, he should be disqualified. And there's many ways that we need to discipline our body, but the one way of undiscipline in our body that will cause us to lose rewards is sexual immorality. Now, we live in a world that is totally sexually immoral. Driving over here this morning, Lynn and I are looking at billboards on the road, all promoting some type of sexual immorality. And there's nothing that will cause a believer to lose rewards faster than to be undisciplined and not controlling our bodies to the point where we sin sexually. In 1 Corinthians 6.18, Paul wrote, flee from sexual immorality. And of course, who's the great biblical example of that? Joseph, right? Leading from Potiphar's wife. Flee, run away. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Paul, here's our Sunday school lesson, right? <laughs> the Holy Spirit inside of us. He says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the God dwelt in the temple in Jerusalem, in the Holy of Holies. But today, the temple of the Lord is the body of every believer, as the Holy Spirit indwells in each one of us. And so, because our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you have from God, God gave us the Spirit, we are not our own. You were bought with a price, of course, the precious blood of Christ. So glorify God in your body. 
glorify God in your body. And you know, all of us have heard the horror stories, or we know people who know the Lord and yet uh, fell into sexual immorality and uh, again, suffer loss of rewards. So we need to keep our eyes on the goal and we need to discipline our bodies and live holy and righteous life for the Lord. A third thing we need to do is we need to forget the past. Forget the past. In Philippians 3, Paul was writing about the sanctification process and becoming more like Jesus Christ. To become mature in Christ spiritually. Or perfect. Not perfect and sinless, but perfect in Christ-like character. And he says in verse 12, he says, not that I have already obtained this, all right? Paul, he wasn't totally like Christ yet. He says, all right, perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. In other words, he's not totally mature in Christ yet. But notice what he says. But this one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said this one thing I do. Kentucky Fried Chicken used to say that, I think. That's one thing we do. But uh, one thing he did is this. He forgot about the past. You and I all have spiritual victories in our past. You and I all have spiritual failures in our past. And what Paul was pointing out here is that we need to forget them. Forget the spiritual victories. Forget the spiritual failures. Because if you don't, they can hold you back from pursuing the upward call of God today in Christ Jesus. Now, he doesn't mean we are to forget them in the sense we don't learn from them. Sure, we are to learn from both our victories and our failures. But we cannot allow them to hold us back from following the Lord, serving the Lord, and having spiritual victories in the future. Does anybody know the name Sergei Bubka? Sergei Bubka? Sergei Bubka, a number of years ago, I'm really showing my age here. <laughs> I remember watching Sergei Bubka in the Olympics many years ago when I was a kid. Sergei Bubka was a Russian pole vaulter, and he was the number one pole vaulter in the whole world. As a matter of fact, before the Olympics came, he was breaking his own world record every time he competed because they would only raise the bar a little bit each time. And so when they had the Olympics, I believe they were in Barcelona that year in Spain, everybody said, well, why have the pole vault competition? Might as well give Sergei Bubka the gold medal. I mean, nobody was close to him. But then, in front of worldwide TV at the Olympics, Sergei Bubka attempted a, a level that he had cleared many times, and he didn't make it. He tried a second time, and he kicked the bar. And the announcers and everybody was in awe as the third time he knocked the bar over again. He didn't win gold, he didn't win silver, he didn't even win bronze. It was an absolute failure in front of the whole world. Now, Sergei Bubka had a decision to make. He's either going to remember all his past victories and say, okay, that's enough, I have plenty of victories, or he can remember his failure at the Olympics, or he could forget them both and go on to new heights. And that's exactly what he did. The world championships the next year, he set another world record and then another world record because he forgot the past. Listen, you have spiritual failures in your life. Some of them, as we would say, doozies. 
and they might not have been too long ago. What Paul is saying, the Word of God is saying to us today, is forget them. Don't allow the devil to hold you back or guilt over something that the Lord has forgiven and cleansed you of. Put it behind you. Other people, it's the other problem. You know, well, I remember we had these great meetings so many years ago, or had these spiritual victories in my own walk with the Lord last year or the year before. What about tomorrow? What about next week? And if we're going to win that prize, we need to forget about the past and press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The fourth thing we need to do we see in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, where Paul again uses the uh, illustration of athletics to Timothy. And he says to Timothy, Timothy, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So if we're going to win the prize, we have to obey the rules. Well, where do we find the rules? Here it is. God's rule book. And that's why we need to study the Word of God, read the Word of God, memorize the Word of God, and meditate in the Word of God so that we know and we understand all of God's standards of righteousness. And we need to obey, in other words, live our Christian life in obedience to God's rule book. How about the name Ben Johnson? Remember Ben Johnson? Ben Johnson, along with Carl Lewis, Carl Lewis of Willingboro, New Jersey. Now, Olympics, not too long ago, Carl Lewis was from Canada, sprint champion, and Carl Lewis was one of the greatest athletes ever, another sprint champion. And they went to the Olympics to determine who was going to be the world's fastest man. And again, I can remember as a kid seeing this live on TV where, uh, Carl Lewis, or Carl Lewis and Ben Johnson got in that starting block in the final heat for the gold medal. And when that gun went off, Ben Johnson, man, it was, it was amazing. It was like he was shot out of a gun. And Carl Lewis never had a chance. Ben, ben Johnson just all the way went through. All of Canada was cheering for their men, now the fastest men beat that bad American, Carl Lewis, and rejoicing. But after the race, they took a test, and turned out Ben Johnson was taking performance enhancing drugs. And Ben Johnson was stripped. And all of Canada that was so proud were now humiliated, not to mention Ben Johnson. And Carl Lewis was given the gold medal. Why? Because Ben Johnson didn't compete according to the rules. And you know, we can fool other people. We can break God's rules and think we get away with it. But at the judgment seat of Christ, everything's going to come out. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And so, compete according to the rules. And one last thing. In Hebrews chapter 12, the writer of the Hebrews, again, exhorting the Hebrews about their Christian race. And by the way, the Christian race, what kind of race is it? Is it a sprint? No, what is it? It's a marathon. It's a marathon lived one day at a time from the day you put your faith and trust in Christ to the day we die or he comes and takes us, whichever happens first. It's a marathon your entire life. And so the writer of the Hebrew said, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those witnesses are the heroes of the faith in chapter 11. The idea here is we look back at their lives of faith, and that is a witness to us. And so we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. He says, let us also lay aside every weight. 
and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. He says we need to lay aside every weight. Well, what are weights? Weights are anything that we have in our life and that we allow in our life that we know do not please the Lord and yet we carry them around with us. And, Paul, and the writer of the Hebrews says, you have to lay it aside. When I was in high school, Notre Dame High School in Trenton, New Jersey, uh, believe it or not, I played basketball at least my first two years. <laughs> then everybody else kept growing and I stopped. <laughs> but we used to wear ankle weights at practice. And we would go around and have to jump up and touch the backboard and everything. And when you took those weights off, man, you could really run faster, jump higher, kind of like PF Flyers, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, can you imagine a sprinter getting up to a race and he has ankle weights on his weights as he gets in the starting block? And say, man, how foolish. That's exactly what we do. The sins that we tolerate in our life, the things that we allow because we like them, we enjoy them, but we know they are not pleasing to God. We know they do not glorify the Lord. We know they're holding us back, weighing us down in our Christian life. And the writer of the Hebrews says, lay it aside. Get rid of it. Sometimes it's an unsaved boyfriend or an unsaved girlfriend. Sometimes it's a particular sin that we indulge in. He says, lay it aside. You don't have to pray about it. <laughs> you don't have to think about it. Get rid of it. Remember the story of Jonah? When the Lord said, Jonah... Rise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach against it. Their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah says, no, Lord, I'm going to go the opposite direction to Tarshish, running from the presence of the Lord. You know the story. The Lord brings up a storm. And the sailors, the mariners, were afraid because they knew that they were going to drown. And they said, Jonah, what should we do to you so that the storm will be calm for us? And what did he say? you got to throw me overboard. <laughs> throw me overboard. Because I know it's because of me this tempest is upon us. And they threw him overboard, and what happened to the storm? It's gone. We need to throw that weight overboard. Get it out of your life. No more tolerating. No more allowing it to hold you back. So, beloved, we've been blessed so much with this great salvation we have with the Lord. And the Lord has told us in his word that one day we're going to stand before him, and he's going to reveal the truth. And we're going to be judged and rewarded based upon our life after we're saved. And so the word of God tells us, keep your eyes on that goal. Discipline your body. Forget the past. Obey God's rules and lay aside every weight. And as we strive to do that, then one day, again, as we stand before him, we will hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, I always say the easiest part about the word of God is preaching it. Now it's the hard part. Doing it. Obeying it. But by the grace of God, by God's divine enablement, he can give us the grace to do all of these things so that we can serve him faithfully the rest of our lives. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless the Master's Church. And uh, again, thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity to come and be a part. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for, again, the great salvation we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you that we are in a race.
this marathon race to glorify you throughout our lives. And I pray that you would help each one of us here to heed these instructions that you've given to us. Help us not to get off onto tangents, the things of this world, but help us to keep focused on you and help us to glorify you. I pray for those that have had successes or failures in the past that are holding them back. You would give them the ability just to put it behind them and to reach forward to what's ahead and before. And help us to lay aside those weights, those things that we tolerate and allow, which we know do not please you or glorify you. Lord, we want you to feel at home in our hearts. And so help us to glorify you in our lives. And we thank you that you've given us your spirit. You've given us a new nature. And that through the Lord Jesus Christ, we can do all things through him who strengthens us. Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you in Jesus' name.